Thank you, Rod. It's, a, it's always fun to be here. I enjoy this. Um, despite the fact that I'm known as an orthopedic surgeon, I uh, had a joint appointment as a professor and still do at neurosurgery at Hopkins. So uh, I've worked very closely all my life that way. Um, here are some of my disclosures, which are not important. You know, spinal deformity is a fascinating thing. If you look at the history of innovation in spine, uh, with reference to at least instrumentation and some other things, it really has come out of the deformity surgeons. Now, this man, a Swiss, many years ago, as you can see, uh, almost 200, a Swiss surgeon who was a gastrointestinal surgeon said, only man who is familiar with the art and science of the past is competent to aid in its progress in the future. And if you look at the current literature articles that are published, very few of them go beyond five years from the current time. The old literature, which is relevant, is rarely quoted. And I think that's a mistake. What I'd like to do is to take you through from ancient times to today in terms of spinal fixation in particular. Um, the uh, ancient Egypt Hippocrates casting surgical approaches with complex resections and etc. Lord Krishna in India in this 3500 BC talked about traction for correction of kyphosis. It's very interesting to watch the history over my career, how this has become very important again in the last 10 years, especially. This uh, famous Brit Smith, Edwin Smith, discovered papers when exploring along the Nile, and here's the papers, the papyrus papers, uh, talked about traction in Egypt at that time, also to correct deformity. 1700 BC, this illustration of spondylolisthesis exists. And you can see here, the boxing boys, these are called. You can see the patient with uh, lysthesis here and the lysis on the other side. Now, more historical correction came with Hippocrates. He talked about bracing. They put immobilized people after correcting their surgery through rather, rather brutal methods, but really no worse than what we do today, except it's all external. Taking uh, bandages and soaking them in patient's blood and then wrapping them around them. Uh, these were mostly probably for tuberculosis, which of course was the rampant disease for many centuries. Around the same time or shortly thereafter, again, another great Greek, Galen, coined the words lordosis kyphosis. He was very interested in astrology and was actually imprisoned because of his beliefs that the earth was round and went revolved around the sun. So he uh, suffered from that. Then in France, in the 16th century, this man who is the father of pediatric orthopedics, pediatric spine, wrote a number of papers talking about correction of deformity. Um, you may have seen about two years ago this in the literature when the skeleton of King Richard III, who you've, those of you who are Shakespearean uh, students will understand, uh, he was of course uh, ostracized by many of the royal court and was killed and buried. And when they were excavating, I think it was in Newcastle, uh, for to build a new paving lot, they found his bones just a couple of years ago. And you can see the severe deformity which Shakespeare spoke about. If you're interested in art, I would recommend that you go and visit the Queen's, Queen Elizabeth's Art Museum in Buckingham Palace, where this sketch done in 1833 with a deformity is shown. Uh, if you're interested in anatomy, and I don't know if the new person is in the room, the, the doctor that you just hired, Rod, from away from uh, down south, um, is in the room. But if you go to Krakow, Poland, 
where this, they have made a huge exhibition of Vesalius anatomical studies. You will enjoy looking at his spinal pathology that he exhibited years ago. Kyphosis was a common term, as you know, uh, Aristotle, I mean, Hippocrates and Galen brought the word up, but it was really brought to major light in the uh, 18th century by Pott in Great Britain, who described Pott's disease because tuberculosis was rampant. And those of you who read the literature will still see many publications out of China and India on the treatment of kyphotic deformities of the spine secondary to tuberculosis. Um, now, the first recorded operation goes back a long way to the 12th century when a slave was struck across the back during a battle and was rendered paraplegic. Um, a laminectomy was performed. We don't know the outcome, but if you look at the statistics from the First World War, when 90% of paraplegics were dead within one year following trauma to the spinal cord, I'm sure that this slave in the 12th century didn't survive very long either, largely due to bladder problems, as somebody mentioned earlier. Um, bracing took over. Really, surgery never advanced at all uh, in those early days. Um, and bracing was the mainstream. And you can see some of the ancient barbaric sort of bracing that went on at that time to correct deformity, uh, secondary primarily to tuberculosis, and then polio. Polio started to come. And you can see here some of the little more in the 19, 18, uh, 20th century braces rather early on. And then in the uh, 50s in Milwaukee, uh, these two men, Blount, a surgeon, and Schmidt, an orthodist, uh, developed the Milwaukee brace, which really is today still the paramount brace used for correction of deformity. At the beginning, they did push on the chin, and in the growing child, this produced this deformity, so that was discontinued for a throat uh, collar rather than a chin brace. And there have been many other types of braces that have been developed. On your left is from France. On your right, from Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, surgery started in the 19th century, again in France, by Guerin. And I'll talk more about him. Anterior suggest surgery was suggested by Cudavilla, again in uh, Spain in 1903, and Forrest de Smith in the United States was the first to do it in this country, although the Japanese had been involved around the same time. Guerin did myotomies because he thought these muscles were fibrous and tight, causing the deformity, and then put them on a table like this and corrected the deformity. Unfortunately, his results were uh, ostracized. He was banned from practice, moved to Belgium, Malgaigne, those of you who are interested in pelvic trauma, was a great Frenchman who wrote a lot about pelvic trauma. And he was one of the ostracizers who said it is important to know what to do, but no less important to know what not to do. Uh, he was criticized also by Velpo, uh, one of the fathers of modern day shoulder surgery. They did a number of myotomies. Most of them uh, did not uh, improve. Volkmann from Germany talked about rib resection surgery to take away the rib hump, which is still done occasionally post-surgical if it remains a problem, which is less so nowadays with modern fixation. Um, fixation individually of the vertebra started in the United States in two places. First in Texas, where silk sutures were used, soaked in carbolic acid, I mean silver wire was used rather, uh, and then in Kentucky, um, Hadra was a, a silver wire man. And then in Kentucky, this uh, Captain Wilkins, again in the mid 1800s, uh, used the first form of pedicle fixation, where he took uh, silk, soaked in carbolic acid, and wrapped it around the pedicles to produce fixation. Unfortunately, the FDA didn't recognize this as direct pedicle fixation, a major problem, certainly in my career, 
and some of the older people in the room may remember the debacle with the FDA and the lawsuits about pedicle fixation in the eight, 1980s and 90s. Callot from France, working at what was a wonderful place just recently closed on the coast of Normandy, uh, Berclage uh, used plaster casts and used periosteum uh, stripped off from the tibia, usually, to wrap around the lamina and transverse processes with a little bone graft. Well, in children, just scoring the spine will often produce an arthrodesis, and there was some reasonable success. In the United States, the first clinic was established at the Children's Hospital in Boston by Bradford, no relationship to David Bradford, our modern Bradford fellow, uh, and clinics became established around the world. This person, also an American, uh, gave a paper at the American Orthopedic Association where he had implanted steel bars wired to the spine. Didn't, wasn't very good, didn't produce very solid fixation, and as you can see here, uh, the uh, protrusion of the bar at the end, but it was a beginning, uh, and the bars, of course, were not good stainless steel, and there were a lot of problems with that. Now, in New York, two surgeons at the same time uh, began bone grafting directly to the spine. First was Albi, uh, who split the spinous processes and inserted a graft from the tibia. When I began my career, this was still being used. Uh, there's a picture of Albi. And then this man, Hibbs, uh, talked about doing fusions in deformities. Uh, he stressed a technique, which is decortication of the lamina, as you can see here. He did not, however, do any facet joint excision. Uh, that came along later. He was severely criticized by his colleagues and had to change practice. He was a bit of an oddball, but if you look at his technique of decortication, that is used today and is still the preferred technique to take a gouge, because by using a gouge, you create twice the surface area for fusion than you would if you used uh, a burr to decorticate. I do not advocate ever using a burr to decorticate. Um, other people around North America took on the Hibbs work and began doing fusions for deformity. Casting techniques were still uh, commonly used. This is an example where the patient would be placed in a cast. These are children, and the cast would be split and a turnbuckle applied. Naturally, this only corrected the deformity in one plane. This was horrendous for the children who would remain in hospital for up to a year frequently, very smelly, high rates of infection, and so on and so forth. And here are some of the other examples. Uh, first major report of any series uh, was given in 1941 at the American Orthopedic Association meeting. And as you can see, the good to excellent was 31% uh, with a high degree of pseudoarthrosis. This was with casts and onlay posterior bone grafts. Uh, this man came along, uh, well-known in Los Angeles, a uh, great, great person who developed very good corrective casting techniques for correcting deformity. And you can see here the table uh, which he used the patients on, the straps to correct the deformity, uh, which I used when I began my career in the 60s. And this was called the localizer cast. Uh, it would be frequently changed, and the Correction carried out uh, slowly, and then a window would be made, and the surgery would be done posteriorly. The patient would remain in a cast often up to a year. Uh, infection rates were a little high because of the prolonged immobilization in a plaster cast. Uh, Le Measure, who was one of my mentors in Canada, uh, used a fishnet technique, and they would hang the children for weeks in a thing like that, and then place them in a cast. These kids were in hospital for a year, and you can imagine the psychological effects of, of that might have uh, produced. So, so wonder to know why the Cirque du Soleil from Canada. 
Thank you. <laughs> well, and that's pretty good. You're right. Um, everybody knows what Cirque du Soleil is. Okay. Uh, now, two people in Boston. This is not a deformity, but I think it's of great historical nature. A neurosurgeon, an orthopedic surgeon, talked about rupture of the intervertebral disc, and this was published in 1934. There's a long saga of disc herniation, but they didn't really know what it was. Uh, these people in Europe talked about it, as you can see. Uh, again, in Europe, somewhat gold, uh, in the United States. Now, the original surgeries were done transgerally. The gyro was opened posteriorly and anteriorly. The disc removed and the gyro closed. You can imagine it was a little bit more, probably produced a lot of arachnoiditis and stuff like that. And it wasn't until 1939 that Love talked about the interlaminar extradural approach. And here you can see uh, what, what a hard disk, these were called enchondromas. They weren't really, they were just hard calcified disks. Uh, Dandy, there's Goldthwaite's description. Dandy, uh, initially from Baltimore, subsequently Boston described it as well. And there's a picture of Mixter, neurosurgeon, and Barr, an orthopedic surgeon. Now, all of this would not have been possible. As I said earlier, the infection rates were great, but Sir Andrew Alexander Fleming, who you may or may not recognize, the discoverer of penicillin, really saved surgeons' lives and the patients, of course. I can recall in my early days treating soldiers with non-unions of the tibia, uh, and uh, we would treat them with uh, 50,000 units of penicillin and an onlay bone graft, and 85% would heal on the first operation. And nowadays, of course, you haven't got any antibiotics that can treat that more or less. This great man, after the war, educated a number of surgeons around the world in New York City and described the Cobb technique. And uh, one of the interesting things is that he used cancellous bank bone. Uh, one of the first, uh, but he also said it does not take the place of good technique in doing fusion. And he was talking about decortication of the spine. In Europe, again, a great man, James, who was the chairman of orthopedics at Edinburgh, uh, who was also, incidentally, a uh, commando during the Second World War. He was parachuted into Yugoslavia, where he joined the local uh, forces, Tito's forces, to fight the Germans, and he, he gave great war stories. I knew him personally and spent some time with him in Edinburgh. Uh, but kids at that time still spent a year in hospital, and the pseudarthrosis rate was huge, and the infection rate still was a major problem, and correction was often not maintained. Again, in Europe, this man developed a spring, initially for treatment of spinal trauma, it was used for scoliosis, but the problem is that the hooks at the ends of the spring, because of the motion, eroded the bone and most of them failed. He died prematurely. I spent three months in Russia in 1968. I visited this man. They fused everybody from the pelvis up with these jacks in Russia, and uh, most of them didn't work very well because it didn't have secure fixation. Uh, the 1960s saw the development of discography in Sweden, electromyography, uh, oil-based myelograms, posterolateral fusion by Wiltsey and McNabb, the occasional anterior fusion uh, in the lumbar, and of course the cervical spine. The 60s saw the introduction of what was really good fixation, Harrington rods, and the description of spinal stenosis. Although this had initially been described in France in the early 1800s, it wasn't until the late 50s that a good neurosurgeon from Holland, Verbeest, described uh, this. He was ostracized by his fellow neurosurgeons in Europe and actually became a good friend of a number of people in the orthopedic field. Uh, this is a picture of Harrington. Harrington was born in Kansas and practiced in Houston. Now, you may remember that in those days, polio was rampant in the United States. Uh, this is his original instrumentation, pretty simple. The reason he developed, developed this instrumentation uh, 
was because putting those kids and young adults into a cast in the humidity of Houston was worse than being imprisoned by ISIS today in Syria. Uh, so um, he, uh, he did this to avoid casting. He did not do a fusion originally, and he was uh, advised to do a fusion by uh, John Moe. This is an early case, an adult that I did years ago. It provided distraction and compression and only corrected the mobile ends of the curve and caused flattening of the lumbar spine. If you compare his original instrumentation to today's, you can see why the price of healthcare has gone up significantly over the years. Uh, and today we have everything at our hands. Now, it began the modern era and is still used in many parts of the world usually in combination with sublaminar wires or wiring to the spinous processes, as you can see in this illustration here and the lateral view. Harrington was a stimulus to development of societies, and I would, uh, this really began in 1966 with the first meeting. This year is the 50th anniversary of the Scoliosis Research Society, and if you're interested in pharma, you should go because it's gonna be a big show. The SRS was the first spine society that developed. It is focused on deformity primarily over the years and it's a great society and I would urge you to go and join the society if you can. The HALO was introduced in Los Angeles by Dr. Perry at the rehab hospital there, Rancho Los Amigos and Vernon Nickel and they combined it often with a cast, as shown here, uh, and various other forms of halo immobilization came along, shown here, and this was one of our own, halo pelvic, which I did about 100 patients with very severe over 100 degree deformities, stretching them out over a period of three to four weeks, and uh, that was good, but it was difficult for the patients and was abandoned after five or six years. The person on your extreme right, the tall man, is John Moe, who is really the real father of, uh, of surgery, spinal surgery in the United States. He's shown here with Leatherman from Kentucky and a Frenchman, Cottrell. Moe introduced facet excision, which in addition to what Hibbs did, is today's modern form of posterior fusion. He convinced Harrington to add a fusion. He did a number of other great things as well as being probably at the, of his time the best teacher. Stagnera from France introduced more particularly the wake up test, which is still the gold standard for monitoring, interoperative monitoring of neurological problems. Uh, and uh, it was a tremendous advance, really, having lived through it. Traction has returned, and many children today in children's hospitals undergo prolonged traction. My good friend, Dr. Boyachi from New York City, who has recently retired and returned to Ghana, has kids in traction like this for up to six months, correcting very severe deformities slowly. So that has returned. Resection of congenital problems goes back a fair ways as well into the 30s, 40s, and 50s. This was a man from Great Britain, uh, compare from Chicago, reported on cases. Both of them became paraparetic, and he just said he didn't think it was a good procedure to do. Um, the uh, other people in New York City, Von Lockham, Smith, DeForest Smith, removed vertebral bodies for the treatment, reported in 1933. Uh, they did a two-stage procedure. Uh, the results were not clearly published, but there were high complications. Moon in uh, Japan uh, really brought on anterior inner body fusion with anterior grafting, posterolateral fusion introduced by Wilsey from Los Angeles and McNabb from Toronto, who were close friends. Anterior surgery, revived in a large way for deformity in the early 70s. The indications were for decompression, as you've seen today, anterior fusion, anterior release, and anterior correction. 
Uh, John Hall uh, from Toronto and Boston's Children's Hospital used short fixation in adolescents to correct deformity. Uh, and this worked pretty well as long as he got them straight. If they didn't, then they would get uh, topping off above and, and below the, the instrumentation. Here's a lateral view showing bone on bone fusion. This man, Dwyer, from Australia, introduced the real first corrective technique anteriorly. He was a brilliant uh, gentleman, very nice. Unfortunately, he died at an early age from uh, stomach cancer, gastric cancer. And here's a case which I did in the mid-70s in a 45-year-old woman correcting her for me. The problem was this was a cable which was introduced through screws. It was all titanium. The problem was that you lost lumbar lordosis. And although you corrected them well in the coronal plane, the sagittal plane was a problem. Then this man here, who is still alive, Klaus Zilke from Germany, uh, with John Hall uh, from Toronto and the Boston Children's Hospital, introduced the first method of derotating the spine. This was done anterior through a thin rod uh, which was slightly flexible, and then you derotated the spine with the instruments. This was very effective. And here's a case that I did uh, some years ago, again in the late 70s. And uh, our results in adults, I did these just in adults, I did not do pediatric surgery, were very, very good using this. And it's now undergoing a bit of a resuscitation in different forms worldwide. Uh, in Switzerland, Magrel, who was actually an Austrian, introduced facet screws. You heard about that earlier today. Bowler, who was a surgeon from uh, Vienna, Austria, introduced screws up through the odontoid, which is used today. AO Spine Group, which was the first study group started. I was involved in that. It was initially in German. And then CT and MRI came along. MRI, uh, to me, is a question. Is it a blessing? It's overused, black disc disease, uh, and, uh, but as we progress, I'm sure, as it is combined with other things, will be uh, a fantastic tool, as it has shown to be in many other aspects of the body. Cervical spine fusions uh, don't get as much attention. Cloward from Hawaii, Smith and Robinson from Hopkins, Bailey and Badgley from Michigan, Simmons from Toronto all developed techniques for interbody fusions. Uh, Morsher from Switzerland uh, introduced the first unicortical cervical plates. Uh, there had been uh, bicortical uh, screws before that, and this uh, introduced what is today a plethora of different instrumentations, probably something like 70 different types of cervical plates. Orozco was the first to use uh, bicortical screws, and then Morsher uh, developed uh, unicortical screws. And just an example of what can be done in the cervical spine today. Uh, out of Mexico, for the same reasons that Harrington did, uh, sublamer wiring with rods was done because he didn't like casts in Mexico either. And he was, uh, could speak English very well, but he spoke very rapidly, and it took most people a couple of years to understand what he was talking about. He, uh, here's a picture of him. He married Risser's daughter, his first wife, and he died prematurely as well. And you can see here, stainless steel wires over a stainless steel rod. It did significantly increase stability. There was an increased risk of neurological problems, as you might imagine. And this is still used popularly today, particularly in pediatrics, and it was married to the Harrington rod as shown here. And we did do it and reported on 45 cases of degenerative scoliosis in the mid-80s, uh, showing an example here with fusion to the sacrum, and you can still see the oil myelogram there. Um, the pedicle screws were first introduced in Vancouver, just north of here by Boucher. Uh, they did, were not attached to longitudinal members. It was the French, Roy Camille, who first used uh, rods and plates. I did my first pedicle screw fixation serendipitously in a fracture dislocation in 1973. And then Cottrell Dubosset introduced them for deformity. And this really ushered in the modern era. Uh, 
There's a picture of Roy Camille. He was born in Martinique, France, and was a great lover of wine. <clears throat> I'll tell you a little antidote. How many of you have ever uh, drunk Beaujolais Nouveau? Raise your hands. What's the matter with you guys? Don't you like wine? No? What do you drink? I hope not lousy American beer. Uh, uh, anyway, um, I said, you know, there are all these 747s flying over from Europe filled with cases of Beaujolais Nouveau. I said, it's not possible that France could produce that much. And he said to me, he said, Jean, that is right. He said, it is 50% Algerian wine diluted with water. So be careful what you buy. I think nowadays they're a little stricter about it. Anyway, he died prematurely. This is a picture of Verbeest, really the modern father of spinal stenosis. Um, these two men, both of whom are still alive, uh, uh, Dubasset on your left, Cottrell on your right, uh, developed the first system posteriorly to derotate the spine. Uh, they were great men. Uh, Dubasset is the only surgeon on the French Academy of Science. Uh, he's retired, and Cottrell has been long retired. And this showed the initial neural rod and some of the uh, other things. I used it in first case in 1986 with hooks and subsequently changed to screws. Uh, there is Cottrell receiving the highest award from France from President Mitterrand. He is a wonderful man uh, to know. And he provides a lot of money for education and research around the world. And there you can see uh, him with, uh, I think I showed this earlier, with Mo. Um, and here shows uh, the CD system with uh, pedicle screws. Now, the 1990s saw, saw a plethora of screw development. We ran through a tough phase, and I'm sure Nick, Nick may remember this, uh, with the FDA not approving them, and there's a big lawsuit which destroyed essentially one of the spine companies. Medtronic, at that time, wasn't known as Medtronic, it was De a sophomore Danic resisted and won the lawsuits, or at least they were dropped. I spent 16 hours in court testifying about it as I was president of the SRS in 1987, and uh, led to great litigation problems. Uh, fortunately, that went away. Then there were other things introduced as well, the BA cage, round cages, and allografts were proven to be valuable in anterior surgery. However, with the development of all these symptoms, remember, it can never replace a solid fusion. And one of the problems with modern fixation is you don't know when it's fused. And long two years follow-ups aren't enough. You need to have about five-year follow-ups because of the, uh, they pre prevent bone from uh, taking any stress and bone forms best under compression. Um, the first publications in adult deformity came out of Sweden in 1969, there were 12 cases. I produced a paper in 1972 of 94 cases. And here's an example of what you can do. This is not a degenerative scoliosis. This is an idiopathic scoliosis with degenerative changes in a 76-year-old woman treated uh, through complex surgery. And you can treat older people. But as we heard earlier from our colleagues from San Francisco, Today, with minimally invasive surgery, we can do a lot better uh, than, uh, than what I used to do. Uh, and this shows the restoration of lordosis with inner body grafts and fixation. And again, an example. Anterior fixation I int introduced uh, for degenerative disease in the early uh, 1980s. This is uh, an I-beam plate out of AO, and we would use screws. Uh, there's the anterior screw with inner grafts, and this only cost about $25, in contrast to modern fixation, which would be $2,500. Uh, it was and it worked quite effectively, but you had to know your anatomy. I did not use a vascular surgeon. So let's spend the past few, last few minutes on what I think is the future. We've heard about disc replacement now for many years. I spent. Uh, a lot of work on development of some of these in the early, late 80s and early 90s. 
Uh, I think they have clearly proven themselves in the cervical spine, and I'm happy to see that it's being used more and more. When you looked at this uh, article on your, uh, published by the investors uh, on spinal implants, they thought that disc replacement would uh, replace fusion, and they were grossly wrong. It, has, it will not be the case, but I think in the neck, it certainly is of significant value. Um, now, there have been other great innovations that have come along, so-called great, all of which have lasted one to two years and gone, have gone. Uh, the interbody devices for spinal stenosis, I think is a triumph of technique over reason. Uh, nucleus replacements, there's still a lot of work going on in this. Uh, and what people forget is the nutrition of the disc. You can put stem cells in there, you can put anything, BMP, but how does a disc get its nutrition? Somebody in the front here, tell me. Nobody know? Yeah, through the end plates, eh? And if you look at animal models of disc degeneration, what happens first is the end plate. The sand rat from Israel is a good animal to study for that. And it's the end plates lose their ability to diffuse nutrients, and the disc degenerates. So just replacing it with some mechanical device I don't think is a very smart idea. Obviously, we need a continuum of care uh, from traditional uh, to the more uh, newer techniques. And as Dr. Uribe said earlier, there's no doubt about it. I, I, I wish I was your age. I, 10 years' time, what we're talking about today, you will not recognize. It'll be so different. Uh, with the marriage of uh, a number of things, including biologicals, uh, minimally invasive techniques, uh, and uh, robotics, and guided surgery. There are many disadvantages to the MIS. I don't think that going to a course is enough. If your teachers do not do MIS, go and spend a month somewhere with somebody. You learn, but you got, it's, it's, it's complex and there is a steep learning curve. Um, there are many different things that have been developed over the years. People talk about the lateral transoas approach, but there's very high incidence of minor neurological problems. Lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, the genital femoral nerve. And if you have a lateral femoral cutaneous nerve injury, putting on your pantyhose if you're a woman, is a, a very disheartening thing because it produces quite a mark dysesthesia in the thigh. There are people now going away to a more anterior oblique technique, uh, which should have less incidence of that problem. So it's, I think it is the future. I'm looking forward to hearing Dr. Uribe talk again a bit more about it. A couple of cases, a 75-year-old male had a previous decomposition Depression. You can see multiple level degeneration down to L5, uh, spondylolisthesis, stenosis, uh, flexion extension x-rays, doesn't show any reduction, axial views, done with the lateral transoas approach and percutaneous pedicle screws with an excellent result. There's no doubt that by increasing the height, uh, the inner body height, that you can do indirect decompression. I think, to my mind, this has been well proven now. Um, and uh, another case, 54-year-old man, again, a previous decompression with development of proximal problems. And you can see the stenosis here, uh, and the facet. And again, treated by um, transoas interbody devices over four levels and percutaneous screws with a good result. Another example of a 46-year-old woman with this deformity, uh, treated percutaneously with pedicle screws using multiple K-wires. I agree K-wires can be a problem. The skin only is cut and <clears throat> the muscles are left intact. Screws are inserted. The rod can be inserted. As shown here, the result postoperatively both, in both planes. Uh, and you can do facet fusions through the flexible tubes posteriorly. Another person, a, a pediatrician, uh, 
lady, 43, again, treated in a similar fashion with flexible tubes that allows you to see the screw heads easily to do facet fusion and to introduce the rod percutaneously, uh, as shown here and her ultimate result too. So it's able to do these things, and I think MIS is truly the future. So the techniques of correction have gone from casting, from Hippocrates' time, through the Harrington rods, sublamer wires, pedicle fixation, and today the tremendous derotation translation techniques which have been developed. The science remains very positive, looking at imaging. Imaging guidance today is expensive, low yield, time consuming, but more importantly for you young folk is irradiation. What you hear about irradiation from the O-arm and others is false. It's much higher than you think. There was a good paper presented two years ago about this, and I worry about it. In my age, it was fluoroscopy, and I have 40 friends who've had their prostates lifted, and a few have had uh, thyroid cancer, so protect yourselves. But there's better stuff coming out. In the next two or three years, you're going to see a lot better stuff with less irradiation. Operating rooms, are, the military are developing these with sensor tables that do blood oxygen without going uh, through the skin and all these sort of things, blood pressure. It's, it's going to be fantastic. What about implants? People always say, well, why aren't you using metals? Why not use plastics and so on and so forth? Well, metals are cheap and easy to use, long-lasting, easy to use. They are not costly to manufacture. So we're not likely to get away from metals into ceramics and glasses and other things. So the future, to my mind, is minimally invasive, guided surgery with minimal irradiation, robotically enhanced. Currently under legislation, robotics cannot do the actual procedure. Uh, in other words, they're not supposed to put the screw in, so on and so forth or do the osteotomy, but that'll change in time. And uh, genetic air engineering and so on and so forth. Uh, tissue engineering is, a, to my mind, a great future with uh, a lot of work going on. Some of it is, I think, charlatanism at the present time, especially in Europe, where people are being injected with stem cells. And I don't think that's uh, appropriate because we haven't got any proof of it. I did some work in trying to develop a true biological disc. This was done in the mid-90s. Uh, not very successfully. You could make something that looked like it, but structurally wasn't very good. Gene therapy, uh, and etc., I think has a tremendous future. A lot of genetic work being done now on, on this type of fusion and what are the causes of diseases. But up to now, most surgery has been correcting the effects of trauma or correcting deformity, fusing the degenerative spine, but not restoring normal function. As new alternatives come, we will have the ability to restore normal, restore normal function, perhaps starting with disc replacement, but will include disc repair and regeneration. And as that famous Yankee said, I'm not a Yankee fan, I'm a Blue Jays fan, and we just beat the Yankees three games in a row which made me feel very happy and took over first place. Uh, the future ain't what it used to be, that's for sure. And Plato, 2,000 years before Yogi Berra, said no physician, insofar as he or she is a physician, considers his or her own good and what he or she prescribes but the good of the patient. For the true physician is also a ruler, having the human body as his or her subject and not a mere money maker. Remember that, really remember that. Remember your patients, that's what you're there for. And the unanswered question in deformity surgery is PJK, proximal junctal kyphosis. Anyway, thank you very much for listening. I hope I haven't bored you, uh, but uh, you can go back and read your literature now with a little happier foresight. Thank you very much. <laughs>